So yes, um, so for those of you who don't know me, I, uh, I'm Krishna Shok on Twitter and I've, uh, I'm the author of uh, Masala Lab, the Science of Indian Cooking. Um, and so while it might seem odd that uh, bread is seen as a very Western thing, uh, it is not. Uh, bread is universal. Uh, bread, is, uh, bread is something that uh, mankind has been cooking, uh, making uh, for the last 5,000 years, right? So in fact, pretty much ever since uh, the domestication of wheat, we've had some form of bread again. Obviously, flat breads were probably the earliest one. Um, and bread has its origins in, in this part of the world, I mean, in the sense in, in Asia, right? So in Mesopotamia, right? Um, and from there, uh, it spread everywhere. In fact, the, uh, uh, even, the, uh, even the Indus Valley uh, is, uh, is expected to have been more of a wheat and barley-based civilization and not a, not a rice-based civilization, which, which came uh, later, right? Um, so the magical, amazing thing about uh, bread is the fact that uh, you can take flour, water, salt, and yeast. Just these four things, right? Um, and if you really just uh, leave the modern story and sort of think about the past, the yeast is in fact implicit. The yeast is, is already there because uh, wild yeast exists everywhere, right? So that's the, that's the origin of sourdough, which we will talk about. So with just these four ingredients, the fact that you can turn uh, wheat flour, into this most magically delicious, uh, just amazing, rich depth of flavor, airy, soft uh, product, right? Especially given that floor by itself is actually completely tasteless. Right? It has no flavor, no odor, no smell, nothing, right? It's just, just starch and protein, right? Uh, and then you're just able to use this microorganism uh, called yeast to ferment it and then turn it into the most amazing thing. Then you use uh, high temperatures and thus the Maillard reaction and a series of other reactions that we will talk about to convert just these four dead simple things that are most commonly available everywhere and turn uh, that into bread, right? So that's the, that's the magical thing. And there are a dizzying variety of them, right? So normally when we say bread, we immediately think a, a loaf of bread, but naan is bread too, kulcha or kamiri roti or, or paratha or chapati. Or, or puri or batura, uh, they're all varieties of bread. Right? So that's where we are. So as I said, there's, a, there's an interesting story about uh, the origin. I, you know, uh, uh, while I really want to get down to the science, uh, but uh, I can't resist a little bit of history just to start with. Right? Um, so the fascinating aside about how uh, the oldest evidence we have for bread, uh, for baked bread, is is five thousand years ago in Mesopotamia, right? And we kind of also know that between five to 10,000 years ago is when we domesticated uh, wheat, right? So what does this domestication of actually mean in the context of a plant, right? Uh, we understand what domestication of an animal meant, right? So you, you capture the young of the animal. Uh, presumably they captured uh, animals like, uh, you know, say wolves, uh, uh, wolf pups. And then that's how over time, you know, we kind of have dogs, right? Uh, likewise, uh, uh, you, you capture wild cattle, calves, and then you slowly domesticate them. Likewise, rams, and you make them goats and sheep and so on, right? Um, so in the context of plants, it's actually quite fascinating, right? So there are broadly, in the interest of really oversimplifying here, there are two categories of plants that we're interested in, right? Plants that are uh, perennial uh, and plants that are annual, right? So perennial essentially means that the plant or the tree or the bush or whatever it is, um, puts out fruit, puts out seed, uh, and the plant doesn't die. So you can take the fruit and, you know, uh, but the plant will again uh, give rise to more fruit. So you take an apple out of an apple tree, uh, the tree doesn't die. So, you know, it, it still put out more apples in the next season, right? Um, on the other hand, annual plants are plants where, you know, the plant puts out all of its effort in maximizing its chances of reproduction in one single harvest season, in one single season, right? Uh, and then the plant dies, right? So hopefully the, the grains will, will either disperse or animals will eat it and then, you know, sort of, you know, deposit it elsewhere and, uh, and then it will grow elsewhere, but the plant puts out all of its efforts in that one season. So, so in general, when humans were looking for plants to see what's edible, what's not edible and so on, they would have focused on plants that were annuals, not plants that were perennial, because these annual plants were likely to have more yield, larger grains, larger seeds. Uh, and more importantly, if you are going to take them, you know, take a sapling and grow it closer to where you live, you have an op opportunity to experiment with it uh, and then take variations from seeds, take ones that have larger grains and so on, right? So that's why most of our, 80% of our agriculture is on annual plants and not perennial plants, right? So wheat and rice, corn, 
you know, literally most of these things, right? Um, and what's also fascinating is that it's annual plants and the fact that we do agriculture and we have to till the soil, right? Uh, you don't have to till the soil for perennial plants, right? They have longer roots and so on. The fact that we keep tilling the soil and we've been doing it for the last 6,000 years is one of, one of the largest contributors to uh, releasing carbon into the atmosphere. So that's a separate story. So there's a fascinating podcast that you can perhaps listen to. So on that and that note, uh, let's start with bread, right? So there are broadly two categories of breads. Uh, breads that are leavened versus unleavened. Um, unleavened, obviously the older one, um, unleavened is, uh, it, it's not filled with air bubbles. Right? Um, and so it's denser. Uh, so, uh, and so therefore by definition, that's to be thick, right? If you make something thick and it does not have air bubbles, it's going to be very hard to eat. Uh, chapati uh, is exactly. So if the chapati isn't thin, it's really hard to eat, right? Um, and so, so leavened breads uh, typically tend to be flat breads, right? So or flaky in some sense, like so your malabar parotta, things like that, right? So that is un sorry. These are unleavened breads. Leavened breads involve uh, the use of either microorganisms like yeast uh, or the use of chemical leaveners like baking soda or baking powder to create air bubbles in the dough. So that those air bubbles are trapped in, in that dough. Um, and then when you bake it, um, so it's easier and airier, right? So once the starch inside cooks, so those air bubbles stay um, and you, you get something that is easy. You can dip it into some gravy um, and, it's, and it's generally about you know, far more edible and delicious product. And I think uh, we have evidence from the Egyptians that they knew about sourdough baking uh, as far as, you know, uh, easily about, you know, 2000 BC and so on. Right? So, as I said, all you need is flour, water, salt, and yeast. That, that gives you the most basic bread. And with just these four things, you can actually make bread that is that will be tastier uh, than any bread that you buy in a large store, right? any industrially made bread. Um, I, and I want to clarify that. So obviously, because a bakery, a good bakery will still bake better bread because they have better ovens. Uh, and if it's a good bakery, you know, uh, they, their processes are more artisanal. But any industrially made bread is going to involve the use of a ton of stabilizers and chemicals and also uh, things that accelerate fermentation because you know speed is efficiency and efficiency is money and so on right so that's uh, that's the thing right so that's that's sort of like the basic introduction right so let's start with what what i'm going to do is talk you through each of these individual elements that go into baking uh, to start with and then we're going to switch to the kitchen and kind of show you the things that go uh, that, that you need to understand what what kind of tools do you need um, i know nadika sort of promised that we're going to bake something uh, but it takes a bare minimum of three hours to bake anything uh, so so in that sense uh, we probably won't be able to bake something live but we'll kind of get that process going so that you'll you, you'll be able to do to repeat it yourself right uh, not only that and then we'll come back and standardize uh, all of that so that you are uh, uh, sort of armed with a series of algorithms for, to really think about different kinds of bread so that you don't have to rely on recipes, right? Um, that said, it's important. Most people uh, kind of know that baking is a far more precise uh, endeavor than cooking. Uh, with cooking, you you can be rough. You know, you don't really, if you're a really reasonably experienced cook, you can sort of uh, find your way around. You can fix mistakes and so on. Right? Uh, baking is slightly more unforgiving in that you have one shot at getting everything right and then uh, that's it, right? So the next time you want to improve something, you have to do it the next time. So you can't fix something. So if you forget something, if you put less salt or if you uh, or if you don't add enough yeast or if there's no enough rice, there's nothing you can do to salvage. It's it's unforgiving in that sense, but it doesn't mean that you have to be tethered to recipes either. If you understand the broad ratios and some broad principles, uh, you can make you know, 15, 20 different kinds of bread uh, whenever you feel like it uh, without having to rely uh, on these recipes, right? Um, and there's just too many recipes, there are too many uh, conflicting methods, and some will say 180 Celsius, one will say 190 Celsius, you're wondering whether it makes a difference and so on, and we'll kind of walk you through all of that so that, you know, you don't have to worry about all of that, right? So let's start with the very first thing, which is flour, right? So um, so the flour, um, typically if you're making, uh, we will only discuss gluten-based breads in this session. Non-gluten is a, is a whole different uh, world altogether. Um, uh, that requires some special uh, techniques and so on. And uh, even after that, it doesn't taste very great. But for those of you with the gluten allergies and who want to eat a gluten-free diet, it's possible. So we, if necessary, maybe in the Q&A, we can address it, right? So we're going to focus only on gluten-based uh, flours. So what is gluten? So gluten, um, and, I, and I wrote about this in my uh, Mint column uh, that was published last week. So gluten is actually, 
a structure formed from two proteins that are present in wheat. Uh, two, two proteins, these are gliadin and glutenin are the two predominant proteins. There are other proteins as well, but these are the two predominant protein molecules in wheat. Uh, uh, it's also present in rye and a few other kinds of glutinous floors, but uh, wheat is what we will talk about, right? Uh, and in the presence of water, they form this elastic structure called gluten. Right? Now, so why do they form that? It's again, because proteins are large complex molecules um, and there are parts of them that like water, so hydrophilic, and there are parts of them that don't like water, so hydrophobic, right? So what happens is that when you work water into the dough, uh, so all of the protein molecules want to turn all of their water loving parts towards the water and water hating parts away from the water. So when you apply this at scale, so it forms a single long elastic structure. The more you need, the more you're trying to force water into the dough and the better the alignment of gluten, so the stronger the gluten structure. So that's really what it is you're doing. So that's why they say the more you need, uh, the better the, the texture of the dough and so on. But if you just put water and let the dough sit for half an hour, it will do exactly the same thing that you can do with like 10 or 15 minutes of eating. So that's called autolysis. Right? So we'll, we'll talk about that. Right? So this structure essentially ends up means that all the water loving parts are on the inside and the, all the, all the water hating parts are on the outside, uh, which is why you're able to knead that dough and create sort of like the structure that can trap air molecules. So provided you put yeast inside and the yeast is eating all the sugars and in the starches in the wheat and it's starting to sort of burp out carbon dioxide, that carbon dioxide gas wants to escape, but it can't escape because the gluten structure forms this elastic thing. So it expands uh, and without cracking, it just simply stretches, right? So that's why dough rises, right? So this, in the presence of yeast, the dough will rise. So this is exact. So it's yeast eating the sugars, uh, burping out uh, carbon dioxide, and that then is not able to escape simply because the, it almost forms a waterproof, airproof covering uh, the, the gluten structure forms that are around the, the, the dough. So that's essentially how this entire process works, right? There are a couple of things that you uh, perhaps need to sort of remember in the context of how do you pick and choose your floors, right? Um, again, I'm going to assume that the audience is largely India-based, but I, you know, I, I know that there are pro perhaps people living in Europe and other parts of the world, so I will kind of address that as well. Um, in India, life is much simpler because you're largely going to either talk about maida or rata. That's pretty much it, okay? There is, uh, in the West, you're gonna have a dizzying array of floors, uh, and we'll kind of talk about how to how to understand those, right? The very first distinction is uh, whether the wheat uh, was, is it a winter wheat or a spring wheat? So there's an interesting story about this, right? So the colder the winter, uh, the higher the protein content in the wheat, because the, the plant really uh, uh, makes sure that it conserves all of its energies uh, during the really cold parts of the winter. This is in fact the reason why England, which does not have very cold winters, does not have great quality wheat, while countries like Italy and France have fantastic high quality wheat because they have colder winters. Okay. Uh, and so, so, there, so there are two, th this is one distinction. Uh, for most part, again, uh, depending on what use you're putting, uh, different kinds of wheat will be used, but typically winter wheats tend to be used for uh, bread baking. Okay. So, this is, uh, so this is one. Uh, and uh, so the second uh, sort of this thing is that uh, there are there are ancient varieties of wheat. Uh, the, the, there are varieties of wheat called emmer wheat that was originally domesticated in Mesopotamia and uh, largely not under cultivation anymore because you know over the last uh, 100 years, 100 or so years, uh, we use more genetically modified, uh, more pest tolerant, uh, higher yield varieties uh, of wheat. Uh, um, and so, so there, there are these distinctions. For most part, uh, some people will tell you that oh, one tastes better than the other. But for most part, we, uh, most most of the wheat that you're going to be using is uh, modern wheat. That said, um, in Maharashtra, uh, there is this uh, there is something called chapli atta, which is made from this ancient variety of wheat. There's a lot of pseudoscience around the fact that oh, it's nutritionally amazing, it's ancient, unchanged, not genetically modified. None of those are actually positive things in general. So. Uh, so in general, uh, don't fall for those things, but uh, 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 use anything you want. So it doesn't really matter from a point of view of making baking bread, okay? Now comes the important part, right? So there, let's start with maida. Maida is basically the floor that you get from the uh, 
just the endosperm of the wheat grain. So endosperm is the interior part, which is mostly starch and protein. Okay. Then there is the wheat bran, which has a lot of micronutrients, vitamins, and uh, it also has fats uh, and so on. Um, and then the wheat germ, which also has a ton of micronutrients and minerals and so on. Wheat germ is the next generation, you know, the, the baby wheat, which is inside uh, the seed, right? When you make maida, you skip the bran and the germ and you use only the endosperm and you get a white flow. So that is essentially what maida is. Okay. Um, atta is where you mix some of the germ and some of the bran, not all of it. Otherwise, it will be very hard and very fibrous. Okay. Some of it so that you get a slightly yellower, which is why atta looks slightly yellower and maida looks like plain white, right? Um, and so on. But there's more to it than that. Okay. So when you think about it, the Indian subcontinent uses atta largely to make unleavened breads, chapatis, uh, and, and, and so on. Right? And for those of you who've lived outside India, you know the frustration of trying to make chapati with anything other than atta. Right? So I'm sure many of you would have tried to buy something called whole wheat flour uh, and think, oh, this must be atta. It isn't. The reason is, is that it's whole wheat flour, but with a fair amount of damaged starch and protein, and it's damaged deliberately. It's damaged deliberately so that the chapati is not ultra chewy. If you've ever tried to make chapati with maida, you will realize that it's ridiculously hard to roll. It's just too stretchy and chewy and really hard to eat. On the other hand, atta is just that right texture where a little bit of chew, but mostly flaky and does not form very strong gluten structures, right? So it comes from the fact that you grind the, the wheat between these two giant stones called the chakki, which then really damages a fair amount, generates a lot of heat, right? damages a lot of the starch, a uh, fair amount of starch and protein in the wheat. And that's why you actually get a flour that's perfect for parathas and, uh, and, and chapati, but utterly terrible for any kind of baking because the gluten's all damaged. Okay? So any actual bread, leavened bread that you try to bake with atta will be a little bit dense and never be as airy and soft as what you make with maida. So that's the, that's the aspect, right? Now in the West, um, Maida tends to be called uh, all-purpose flour. Uh, the funny thing is actually Maida is more all-purpose than all-purpose flour. Uh, the reason for that is that all-purpose flour is slightly coarsely milled uh, and it also has more protein, which makes it suitable for a wide range of baking use cases, but not necessarily cakes. Okay? Whereas Maida is okay for both cakes as well as uh, breads. Right? The distinction is that when you want to make a cake, you don't want too much gluten formation. Why? Because you know you don't want your cake to be chewy. You want it to be flaky and soft, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, when you make bread, you don't want it to bread. You don't want the gluten structure to fall apart. So essentially, uh, you need higher protein content and so on. So cake flour is a variety of maida that has even less protein than maida and is very very finely milled so that it's easy to make cakes, right? So so whole wheat is the Western equivalent of atta, except without the damaged starch and protein, far more suitable for doing sourdough baking or traditional uh, bread baking, where you want a whole wheat uh, kind of a flavor. Or especially if you're a very heavy bread eater, where you eat it as a staple daily, uh, you know, there's some nutritional benefit to eating whole wheat as opposed to only the, uh, uh, only the all purpose or what you call refined uh, wheat flour, right? So these are just, so the thing you need to keep in mind is what is the amount of protein it's generally measured as a percentage uh, of the amount of starch and so on. So generally, for example, and we'll show you, so uh, uh, maida in India varies between 9 and 11, 9 and 11, sometimes even 12% protein. Uh, then there is a variety of uh, flour called bread flour, which is much higher, 13, 14% extra uh, protein, which is very ideal, makes bread making a lot easier. Uh, bread flour is not as commonly available in India. You can buy it from Amazon, slightly expensive. Uh, if you're someone who bakes on a very regular basis um, and don't mind the expense, uh, I think it's worthwhile buying bread flour as well. Uh, then there's something called pizza flour, which is again, largely maida, uh, but extra protein, but very finely built. Sort of like cake flour with extra protein. So these are all the different variations of flours uh, that you, you're likely to come across, right? Um, now, the next thing is obviously you need to understand is water, right? So... Um, how bakers normally measure this is something called hydration. Hydration meaning that uh, uh, depending on the kind of flour and depending on the, uh, uh, the kind of bread you want to bake, the amount of water you will use in the dough is going to vary. Right? Um, 
Atta, for instance, is a slightly more thirstier flow. So in the sense that you, you will need to add a lot more water. Uh, whereas Maida is not as thirsty, right? That's, that's what's based on the kind of flow. Second is a kind of bread, right? So general rule of thumb is that the more water you add, the better the final product. But the more water you had, that harder and stickier and more complicated it is for you to deal, to knead and all of that, right? So it, it gets slushy and it sticks all over the place and it's, you know, it's messy for beginners at least, right? So the idea is to hit that sweet spot where you, you are comfortable adding the amount of water that makes it easier for you. But in general, remember that you probably almost always need more water than you think you do. Okay, that's number one, right? Uh, the second thing is, uh, that it's measured as a percentage of the amount of flow. So if, if a recipe calls for 100 grams of flow uh, and it says 60% hydration, then you need 60 grams of water. Remember one thing, in baking, it's almost always better to operate only in terms of uh, weights and not in terms of volume. So no, uh, don't use milliliters, liters, use grams, use a weighing machine. You'll get way, way more uh, consistent results, right? So... That's called hydration percentage. And we'll use this hydration percentage you know, in the subsequences. The second other thing you have to keep in mind is that again, depending on where you are, if you're in India, there's a good chance you probably are using a reverse osmosis filter. And so the water in that is perfect. Actually, it's you know, it's non-chlorinated. It does not have any dissolved salts. I think it's just perfect. Okay. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you are abroad, if you are in a place where the tap water is, is drinkable, is portable, uh, but also tends to be chlorinated uh, to kill uh, to kill germs and so on. Uh, that that chlorinated water will slow down your yeast activity because you know well it's just the chlorine doing its job right of killing microbes. Okay. So you might want to keep that in mind again. And if you have hard versus soft water, hard water also um, impedes gluten development uh, and also slows down yeast activity. So you might want to keep this in mind. So generally, soft water, non chlorinated. Uh, filtered water uh, is is what is typically uh, so the other thing that you keep in mind here is the temperature of the water so if you're living in uh, a place if you're generally living in india the the room temperature water is is perfect etc uh, but if you're living in a really cold place and it's winter and so on if the water is freezing remember that uh, yeast is going to take a lot more time uh, to get active in really really cold conditions so you might want to adjust for that so it's not uncommon for people to slightly warm up their water, but not too hot. Anything over 45 Celsius will kill the yeast. So you might want to keep that in mind as well, right? So, uh, and also remember that when we talk about hydration, um, it sometimes includes other things that you add when you actually make bread that also have water. So, you know, just because it's 60% hydration doesn't mean that you are, and the recipe calls for milk also, doesn't mean that you had 60 grams of uh, water and then you add milk also then it will just be slush okay so milk is 88 percent water so keep that in mind so uh, think in terms of these percentages eggs are 75 percent water right yogurt is again 88 percent water uh, butter is about 20 percent water depending on the kind of butter uh, but you know rest assured it's about 20 percent water rest is fat okay? so eggs also have fat protein and water yogurt is uh, protein carbs and water and fat uh, milk is again a fat carbohydrate and water emulsion, right? So, and butter is just fat and water, right? So you keep in mind that when you add all of these things, you're also adding more water. So just keep that in mind, right? So, uh, so that's water, right? So the third thing we'll kind of discuss uh, is salt. Okay. Now, um, salt obviously is, is absolutely critical in baking. Um, I would actually argue, so, and by the way, so we're only discussing uh, baking breads, not cakes. Okay. So that's a whole separate thing. Uh, uh, and, uh, I would actually argue that even in deserts, a tiny amount of salt is actually required. The best tasting brownies, for example, have a tiny pinch of salt because salt elevates all other flavors, right? Um, and it makes other sweet flavors come out more strongly as well, even when you're making deserts. But if you if you don't put enough salt in your dough, and by the way, you can't, unlike uh, cooking, in cooking, you can fix less salt. You can't fix more salt. In baking, you can't fix anything. Yeah. Um, and so you have to get the salt right. Um, and so in general, uh, keep 1.5% to 2% of the weight of the dough as the amount of salt that you might add, right? Start with 1.5. If you don't think that's enough, you can always add a little bit more. That's the range in which you need to add salt uh, for flavor, right? Uh, it also tightens gluten, right? So that's why uh, in certain kinds of breads where you need to knead a lot and so on, it's not uncommon for the dough to sit in water for a while, uh, half an hour or so, and then you work the salt in so that you've you've let gluten develop before you add the salt because the salt will tighten the gluten a little bit. Uh, 
The last thing uh, that's important here that I sort of forgot to put a bullet for is avoid using iodized salt. Uh, and I'll tell you why, right? So the history of adding sodium iodide to salt uh, is a public health decision that was made, you know, uh, in the middle of the century, uh, probably earlier, I guess. Um, as a way of making sure that we don't have goiter, that we don't have hypothyroidism uh, and so on. So it just seems like a simple way of just adding it uh, to the salt. Everyone eats salt every day, every day. So you will absolutely make sure everyone in the population gets their, you know, uh, quota of iodine, right? Uh, now, you can get iodine from a ton of other sources, from meat, uh, from fish, uh, from milk, uh, and so on. But again, the argument there was that a ton of people are too poor. They're probably not getting enough of those other things on a daily basis. So salt is the best, uh, you know, thing to put this, and it's a tiny amount, and so on. Uh, so the interesting thing is that what happens to uh, when you're regularly cooking on a, on a stuff, right? The temperatures you're operating in are generally around 100 Celsius, around the boiling point of water, right? If you're making any gravies, right? As long as there is water, the temperature is under 100, right? If the temperature was over 100, the water would have boiled. Okay? So at that temperature, iodized salt is perfectly fine, right? But baking happens at 200 Celsius and much higher, double that, okay? And at that temperature, the sodium iodide breaks down okay? and it produces some very nasty metallic tastes. Okay? So you, in general, if you're serious about baking, you want, at least for baking, uh, have a, either a rock salt, uh, if you're in India, senda namak or, you know, or pink salt or anything that's non-iodized, but still reasonably powdered enough, not like the big crystals. Um, and we'll kind of see that in the kitchen. Um, or uh, if you're in the West, kosher, kosher salt, right? I found that senda namak in India, powdered senda namak in India is the closest to kosher salt. And since most baking recipes will ask for kosher salt, which is slightly less salty than your regular table salt, it's it's a good batch, right? So, so this is so try and avoid using iodized salt uh, when you actually do baking. In fact, you should also not use iodized salt when you're deep frying because the temperatures are 175 and it will lend a slightly metallic taste uh, to uh, to anything that you're actually deep frying. Uh, and as I said, between one to two percent is a good starting point. One point five to two percent or so, in terms of how you estimate salt. Right? If you're not sure, if the recipe just says salt to taste, okay, yeah, how do you? And if you're a beginner, this is how you estimate. So one point one to two percent of the weight of the dough. Okay. Uh, the la uh, so the next thing is obviously yeast, right? So yeast is uh, is a is a microorganism. It's a fungi uh, that's literally everywhere. So Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae is the name of the species that we are specifically interested in. It's all over the place, right? Uh, so obviously, along with lactobacilli, which, uh, which kind of turn uh, uh, milk into yogurt, uh, yeast is, is all over the place. So, so yeast, um, the difference between bacterial fermentation and yeast-based fermentation is the fact that yeast produces alcohol and uh, the, the bacteria produces lactic acid. So lactic acid is sour, so, which is why yogurt is sour and uh, yeast produces alcohol, which is why it makes delicious things, right? So, are you, you can make, used to make wine or, uh, um, or beer and also bread, right? So, now, two distinctions. So, there are, there's wild yeast everywhere, right? It is actually on most food items that you buy. The skin of most food items will have wild yeast. Uh, ginger. Uh, skin has yeast. So that's how you make, you know, ginger ale and so on. Uh, the, the skin of urad dal, right, has yeast. Uh, and by the way, the yeast plays a role in, in idli fermentation also, along with the bacteria. Uh, and uh, so likewise, it's, it's all over the place, right? So uh, that's wild yeast, right? Uh, it's also naturally there in wheat flour, uh, atta or maida. It's, it, it's already has it. It's largely inactivated in the presence of water. Uh, in fact, if you just take any kind of floor, add water and let it sit in room temperature in seven days and you keep feeding it more floor every day and discard and keep discarding, etc. In seven days, you will have something called a wild yeast starter called a sourdough starter, right? Which is essentially your, it is your house's yeast that you have cultivated. So, which you can then use uh, to bake instead of using industrial yeast, right? Uh, Remember that wild yeast or sourdough yeast is uh, much slower. Uh, it's, it's not very fast. The fermentation time can take uh, several hours, sometimes overnight, sometimes 24 hours and so on. Whereas industrial yeast is much faster uh, because it's been, you know, uh, it's been carefully genetically modified so that, you know, it's ultra fast acting and it's very hardy and so on, right? Um, and wild yeast is tremendously temperamental, uh, uh, unlike industrial yeast, which is very, very, very reliable, right? So active dry yeast is what you would normally use. Uh, and uh, that's... Really, so 
The second thing is that wild yeast almost always does not exist in isolation, right? Um, it, it's so unlike unlike uh, baking with industrial yeast, where you're only using yeast, where you use a sourdough starter, uh, it's almost always what's called a SCOBY. SCOBY is an acronym for symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. So it's actually a mix of some lactobacilli and yeast. So which is why your sourdough starter actually smells like yogurt because it's all the lactobacilli and the lactic acid uh, that it generates, right? So what happens is that the, 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 the lactic acid bacteria make the, the pH or make the, the entire starter culture quite acidic. And so that keeps out all the other dangerous fungi, like the mold, those hairy molds and all that come. It prevents those because that needs, it cannot operate in an acidic environment, while yeast can operate in a mild acidic environment. So, so it's a very symbiotic relationship where the bacteria sort of acts like the, uh, uh, like a club bouncer, if you will, so that the party can go on inside. So that's basically what the, uh, the sourdough culture serves. So the same, the same philosophy works when you make kombucha or, or for that matter, or for that matter, actually an idli. Okay. So uh, most people don't realize that idli is also, it's not just lacto-fermentation, there's also yeast involved in that. Okay. Uh, now, two things. So there are two kinds of yeast. So there's brewer's yeast and baker's yeast. So there's a fascinating story behind why these are two different things, right? Um, along with baking bread, um, we've also been making wine or making some kind of alcoholic beverages as, as far as mankind has existed, right? So you basically take any source of carbohydrates uh, and you expose it to the air. It's going to turn into something vaguely alcoholic or sour at some point of time. Okay. Uh, now, Obviously, we discovered that if you take grape juice and then you introduce, uh, uh, you know, you let it ferment and you introduce these yeast uh, and then it will turn the grape juice into wine, right? There is a problem, right? So we spoke about the SCOBY, which is the symbiotic relationship between the lactobacteria and yeast. But when it comes to brewer's yeast, there is this really nasty, uh, uh, unfriendly bacteria called acetobacter, uh, which turns alcohol, which eats alcohol and turns it into acetic acid, which is vinegar, okay? So that's how actually you get vinegar. Vinegar is just sour wine. Okay? But if you're someone who makes wine, vinegar is actually a complete disaster, right? Uh, because it's inedible, right? So, and wine is way, way more expensive than vinegar is, right? So what mankind has actually figured out is that the acetobacter needs a higher temperature to operate. It operates in the 25 to 30 Celsius. So we've engineered by careful selection, a variety of yeast that works in exceedingly cold temperatures, like five to 15 Celsius. So in fact, when beer is brewed or wine is brewed, they're brewed underground or in exceedingly cold conditions, right? Why? Because if the temperature was any higher, the acetobacter is all over the place, it's gonna completely turn your beer or your wine into vinegar, okay? And that just completely destroys the whole thing. So that's why brewer's yeast and baker's yeast are different. Brewer's yeast operates at a lower temperature, baker's yeast, operates at a higher temperature. So between the 25 to 30 Celsius, right? Because when you're baking bread, uh, your acetobacter is not a concern at all because one, not enough alcohol is produced. And number two, all the alcohol is burnt off when you put the thing in the oven. Okay? Uh, so we don't have to worry about it. Uh, so obviously one last thing before we kind of, we won't spend too much time on this, uh, chemical leaveners. Uh, chemical leaveners are essentially, if you don't have yeast, uh, uh, if you run out of yeast or if your yeast is expired and so on, uh, and you still want to bake bread, yes, you can. Um, you could use baking soda and baking powder, right? So baking soda is sodium bicarbonate and baking powder is sodium bicarbonate plus some kind of dry acid. Okay? If you are using baking soda, you will also need to use some kind of acid, right? So it's uh, baking soda as a base. When you add an acid, it will produce carbon dioxide and that leavens the bread. And chemical leaveners are not uh, sensitive to temperature as much. Uh, they're also not temperamental and they act really, really fast. So the idea is that you add baking soda and baking powder uh, right at the very end um, and you don't give it more than half an hour because it will rise pretty quickly and then you can bake it, right? Now, obviously, the what's the difference? Uh, is just that the fermentation reactions that yeast produces produces a ton of complex flavors, a lot of umami, a lot of high depth of flavors. That plus the Maillard reaction uh, really creates bread that is delicious. Whereas uh, soda bread based bread is not going to have that kind of depth of flavor, right? Uh, but yeah, as an emergency, I think, you know, it's, I think it's perfectly fine, right? So, so this is floor water salt yeast. And the last thing obviously is that obviously you will run into recipes where there's more than these four added to bread of some kind of bread, right? So we call these enrichment, right? So enrichment can be in the form of fats. So why do we add fats to any kind of bread? So it could be butter, oil, milk, yogurt, eggs, whatever, right? Um, 
So fats, general rule is that they add softness and flakiness. So softness is that the texture of your final bread and when you eat it will be much softer if you work some butter into your dough. Okay? That said, if you add too much, right, uh, fats will shorten gluten strands, right? So that's why, in fact, uh, uh, fats are called shortening in England. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, when, you, when you work so much butter, don't use water at all, and you use dough, you get what you call shortbread. Shortbread is like biscuit. So it's, it's got no chew at all. It's just all flaky. So that's how biscuits are made, right? So that's why they're called shortbread. Um, so when you add fats, it adds flakiness, which means that the gluten strands are shorter, right? They're not big and strong. So that's all. So if you add too much fat, it's hard to get a solid structure, but a little bit of fat adds tremendously improves softness, right? And you can get fats from butter, from oil, from milk, yogurt, or eggs, right? So that's one. Um, eggs by themselves add softness and also rice, right? So eggs by themselves act like leavener. So in fact, if you don't have yeast, right? So in fact, in cakes, we don't use yeast, we use eggs, right? So you whip the eggs, you whip air into eggs, and then you fold in the floor and then you bake it. So the, the egg emulsion, the egg is a structure uh, is what holds the air inside. So there is no baking soda or any of these things involved. So in fact, till baking soda was invented, uh, eggs was how you make cakes, right? So baking soda is a very modern invention, right? Uh, so far, but we've been baking cakes for uh, you know thousands of years. So it's just it's just by using eggs. So there's no other way to bake cakes without uh, without. So eggs also uh, contribute to rice uh, if you whisk them, and they also add softness because eggs also have fat. Uh, they have proteins as well, right? Now sugar is another critical ingredient again, especially if you're making certain kinds of bread. It adds flavor. It adds a little bit of sweetness uh, to contrast uh, with that. Uh, and the other thing that's often commonly used is milk powder, which is mostly just sugars and fats. Okay? So it's just dried milk powder, which is sugar and fat. Uh, and that is a, adds a tremendous amount of flavor. And you will find that very regularly in recipes that call for adding milk powder. right? But if you don't have it, you can just skip it. Okay? Um, and the last thing before we kind of get to some more practical knowledge of how to get started about thinking about this is understanding ovens and understanding tawas. Because you know when we, you, you don't necessarily just bake all bread. When you're making, uh, say, now, or kulchas or kamiri rotis, you're going to use the tawa, right? So, uh, so let's first understand um, distinctions between what is a convection oven toaster grill air fryer. Right? Uh, so all of these operate on the same principle of convection. Okay? So an air fryer is a very small convection oven. An OTG is a slightly larger convection oven, and a convection oven is the full size one. Right? So that's really what it is. Uh, these all operate under the principle of heating air and then having the hot air be able to cook food, right? Uh, you can heat air up to, so the temperature of the air inside an oven can go up to 200 to 30 Celsius, right? To put things in context, a tandoor oven uh, or a wood-fired pizza oven, right? The temperature inside goes up to 450 to 500 Celsius, which is sometimes required for those kinds of breads to make a, so it's a tandoori roti or a tandoori naan um, is very tough to make in a home oven because the temperatures are not high enough. So you might probably want to use a tawa and then you know use uh, a direct flame uh, to actually make that. So we'll kind of talk about that, right? Now this is convection oven. Right? So you're using hot air to eat to eat something. So uh, the second kind of oven you're likely to have is is what's it's quite common now. It's called a combi oven. Um, chances are you're probably just calling it a microwave oven. But nowadays most slightly uh, higher range microwave ovens have a convection function also, right? So but you have to be careful. Uh, the microwave function and the convection function work very, very differently. Uh, so for example, in convection, uh, most of the things you're going to put inside are metal. You don't want to do that in the microwave setting because that will cause sparking. So you want to keep that in mind. Most microwave ovens now have a convection function also. right? Uh, another thing that you will remember is the, so the oven toaster grill or the boiler, the toasting or broiling is another way of cooking. Right? Uh, convection is using hot air to cook something. Broiler or a toaster is to use radiation to cook something, right? So in this case, infrared radiation. So there'll be a bulb on top and it'll glow bright red and the infrared radiation will actually cook something. And it's a way for you to quickly get uh, sort of nice coloring and charring or some kind of you know brown coloring uh, because the radiation directly hits just the surface. So broiling or toasting is not a good way to cook anything inside only to cook the outer surface, right? So often uh, uh, bread toasting works the same way because you don't want to cook the bread inside because then it'll become chewy. Uh, you just want to cook the surface of the bread. That's what a toaster or a broiler is, right? Uh, so with this with this kind of introduction, what we're going to do is that I'm going to have uh, 
maybe Amog or someone run a few polls and I'm going to then switch uh, to the kitchen setup so we can you know, start to get our hands wet and sort of understand what all of these things are. And then we'll come back and generalize the whole philosophy of, of algorithm for baking anything that you want uh, with whatever you saw in the kitchen. All right. So I'm going to quickly stop sharing and uh, switch to the kitchen. So 